Good morning, everyone. We're into week three in the season of Advent, and today we we so far we've journeyed from Nazareth to Jerusalem, and today we find ourselves moving towards Bethlehem. 
And so I have uh, Cindy Westfall with me today. She's uh, a pr associate professor of New Testament at McMaster Divinity College, and you're getting to know her well at this point. And I'm asking her to lead us through our understanding of this geographic uh, town of Bethlehem, which is once again found in the region of Judea. Uh, take it away, Cindy. Well, some of you may know that Bethlehem was King David's hometown. It was his birthplace. And so it figures large because in Micah 5.2, it, uh, it predicts that, um, that the, the ruler in Egypt, in Israel, was going to come from Bethlehem. And, and um, that was taken. That was understood by many to refer to the Messiah. And so that Joseph was descended from David. And when they had to ta when they were taxing the people, it said in scripture that he had to go to his hometown, and that would be Bethlehem, to pay taxes. Well, Bethlehem is not a big place either. It's barely comparable to uh, Nazareth. So it's only around 300 people that they've analyzed the um the uh, archaeology there and say given the the size of the community the size of the houses if all the houses held six or seven children uh that they that there would be about 300 people there so much smaller than we probably thought it's very close to jerusalem it's only eight kilometers away and so this is interesting because as you might understand from the the description of bethlehem it's a very it's a rural town it's it's been a, a a town that does that that grows crops and it has flocks, and um, that has been the case from the beginning. And David was a shepherd, if you'll remember, and so um, the, you they think that probably at the time that Jesus was born, all those crops and flocks were being dedicated to the temple use. And so they perhaps were raising the sacrificial animals that were going to be used in the temple because they only accepted certain animals. And so think about think about what Bethlehem must have looked like. And we and there, there are two scenarios we're going to think about. We're going to think about Jesus' birth and we're going to think about the shepherds. And so in Bethlehem, um, the non-elite homes had maybe two living rooms with flat roofs. And you had multi-generational families, and they all slept together on the roof. There was no private space. And so when Mary and, um, and Joseph came, and Mary's ready to give birth, there really wasn't room on the top of the house. And they, they would have gone to a, a modest home that they were connected with. It's not an inn. There was no Motel 6 they would have checked into that was full. We're talking about, is there, it, can people offer them hospitality in their space? And it was too crowded, not surprising. So they, there were most of the helms were located next to the sandstone caves or limestone caves, and they were either next to them or under them. Some, some, some but um, homes were built right on top of them, and those limestone caves were used to house their animals, and that would have been where Jesus was swaddled in cloths and laid in a manger. Mm. And the landscape around uh, Bethlehem has additional caves, and those were used by the shepherds to shelter the animals. And there were these low stone, lots of rocks and, and stones. There were low stone fences that marked the grazing uh, spaces, watchtowers where the shepherds could keep watch that were made of those stacked stones. And this is the backdrop for the angel proclaiming the good news to the shepherds. Well, thank you, Cindy, as we move to to Bethlehem today, and we'll see you again next week as we we change continents, <laughs> we yeah. move ourselves towards Egypt, and so we look forward to, to hearing about that next week. Bye for now. Bye.
An angel declared unto shepherd keeping their sheep by night. You Bethlehem in the land of Judah are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Having lit the candles of hope and peace, we now light the candle of joy, symbolizing that joy is able to pierce through the darkest of days, for it is a joy that comes from knowing Jesus the Christ has come and stands among us. Let us pray. Creator God, who brings joy that transcends hardship, fill our hearts and our worship with the joy of God that bears witness to the advent of Jesus, our comforter and savior and Lord. Come Lord Jesus, amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Now, in, when I was in the military, um, we'd come back from lunch some days, and, and I, what I call food coma, coma would start to come in. You'd, you know, the, the effects of the food would come in, and you'd start to get drowsy and tired. And you could always count on one of the instructions saying something like, instructors saying something like, get up! Up! All right, sit down. Okay, get up! Up, sit down! We're feeling a little like that this morning, aren't we? It's dark, it's gray, and we're lighting one candle of whole joy. Right? Good morning, everyone. One more time. Good morning, everyone. If you're at home, good morning. Now we're into it. Yes. A few announcements as we begin. We're on the third Sunday of Advent, and uh, we, those of us that are here are, are participating in worship at 10 a.m. Those at home, you're also participating at 10 a.m. The only difference is if you're on YouTube, you're watching this morning's service, and if you are on Eastlink, you're watching last week's service. And so you're one week behind on the candle lighting. But uh, today we're lighting the third candle of Advent. We're focusing on, we are, the theme of the candle is joy. And our focus, as Dr. Westfall has already indicated, is on Bethlehem. And I have to say, I've really enjoyed uh, Cindy Westfall's uh, 
introductions. It gives us another perspective, a historical, uh, a uh, archaeological perspective on these various um, locations that we find in our story of the birth of Jesus as it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, following worship this morning, we have our Sunday school. Uh, Karen is leading a, a study on songs of Advent. Um, Anne is leading uh, a study as well on uh, Licato, uh, Max Licato, on God Came Near. And there's an uh, opportunity for uh, children's Sunday school as well from Sunday to Sunday. And the themes uh, for that are the names of Jesus. Also, our uh, our um, lambs quarters are, are available for our kids during the uh, sermon time in worship. Now, last week I told you that I had a challenge, a parables of Matthew challenge, and four have been taken already. And the challenge is that you take this, the, the lot, one that's remaining is for January 14th, uh, it's about the parable of the unforgiving servant. This reading is set up for four readers, but the idea is that I get a leader to take this on, and you recruit your other readers, and you paraphrase it, you act it out, you dress, you do whatever you want with the passage, and give us your own take on this passage of Scripture, and then I will try to uh, uh, bring it all together during the sermon time. Uh, so we have one left, January 14th. So far, Leslie's taken uh, one of them, and she's recruiting some sociables for that. Uh, there's uh, Karen, who's uh, taken on one of them, and she's recruiting her crew for that. Uh, Myrna's taken one of them, and already has her crew, and already has some ideas for that one. And Lisa has taken on the Ten Virgins. <laughs> <laughs> That didn't quite, quite come out the way it was intended. <laughs> so we have the unforgiving uh, servant left. If you'd like to uh, volunteer to take leadership on this and recruit your team, please speak to me following worship. The uh, food bank donations are still continuing during the month of December, which is our month for collections for, for the corner cupboard. And so there's room at the back. We'll also be collecting over the next two Sundays and our three services during that because we also have a Christmas Eve service next week. Christmas ornaments. We're up to ornament number three now. And we've got, uh, if you were paying attention to the prelude, you would have heard Tannenbaum at some point, uh, Mon Beau Sapin. And so the, the, the um, ornament is a Christmas tree, and the, the hymn that's on it is Little Town of Bethlehem, I believe. So Little Town of Bethlehem. And so if you would like to uh, purchase uh, yet another ornament, there may be a few from the weeks past that may be available. We recommend a donation of $5, and those will be going towards uh, the um, uh, CBM, Canadian Baptist Ministries, Kids at Risk. And um, the, you can get them either pre-made or as a kit. And the kit is manageable. It's a great thing to, to be able to do with grandkids um, uh, or in your own quiet time as you're uh, watching television or something of that nature. Um, anything that I need to add about that, Sherry or Wendy? You're all good? Yeah, I, 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 great assertion of saying, no way, I'm not coming up here again. <laughs> um, this Wednesday, every, when, every uh, month on the third Wednesday of the month, I, I lead a worship service at Age Care, formerly Chartwell um, uh, Residence, and I'm doing that this Wednesday as well at 3 p.m., and we're going to be bringing my guitar out, and we're singing some Christmas carols together. If you would like to join me for that, just speak to me, and we'll see if we can arrange to have a couple of extra voices there for this uh, Christmas caroling evening, uh, afternoon, uh, this Wednesday at 3 p.m. You'll also found in your ABC Connect an announcement concerning a blue Christmas. There, the Plains... Um, Baptist Church is holding a blue Christmas service this Friday at 7 p.m., and so if it's an opportunity to uh, grieve in the midst of Christmas festivities with those who are, um, want to take that time to do that, a little bit like the service we had for uh, Angel Tree, um, but uh, 
want to make you available. We're working really hard as, an, as uh, local churches to stay connected with one another, and this is one of the ways we can do that, is by announcing each other's um, activities. Next Sunday is, East, is Christmas Eve. Now, I was taken by surprise that this Christmas Eve was this quick. I usually go, oh, I got the first Sunday of Advent, and then the second Sunday of Advent, then the third, then the fourth, and then Christmas Eve. And it turns out that I'm losing a whole week there because Christmas Eve is on the fourth Sunday of Advent. And so we, join you to, we invite you to join us this, uh, this next Sunday for our Advent 4 service, which happens to be on the 24th of December, followed by in the evening our candlelight service, Christmas Eve service at 7 p.m. And if you're at home, it's one opportunity to gather and to bring in the, the Christmas uh, celebration uh, among friends and, and colleagues and neighbors um, for worship. Am I missing any announcements this morning? Well then, let us continue worship God, worshiping God. City.
be seated. <clears throat> well, it's the third Sunday of Advent. Christmas is almost here. There's still the family gatherings, the wrapping of gifts, the preparing of meals, the cleanup after the meal, the visit with in-laws and with family. And I'm already tired, and it's the third <laughs> Sunday of Advent. If you're like us, you take on far more than you can chew every Christmas, and every Christmas you tell yourself as a New Year's resolution, never again am I going to do this. And so I feel it in my bones, and I feel it in yours as well. So let us pray for strength. Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we are so thankful that Jesus entered into this world so broken and lost and revealed himself to us. Week after week, oh God, we gather to worship this gift you have given us. Not only your son as a Christ child, but your son as a teacher, a leader, the giver of new life through his death on the cross. Our lives, oh God, would have no purpose beyond this life were it not for him. And we are thankful, O oh God. Time and time again, the knowledge of our salvation fills us with joy. And yet in our efforts to celebrate and remember and, re and give thanks, we're exhausted. The joy that we have expected out of this season leaves us feeling weary. Remind us again why we're here this morning. Remind us again why we celebrate this season. Remove all the trappings, O oh God, that prevent us from seeing you and resting in your presence. May all that we do be for your glory. We pray for those, O oh God, for whom this is a difficult season. We pray for those who are coming to terms with reunions that will not happen. celebrations that are not going as planned. Heal our weary bones and spirit, O oh God, and fill us with the joy and the knowledge that wherever we're at, you are with us. We are never alone. Gift us, O oh God, with an appreciation for what Jesus is doing and has done. And now, O oh God, hear our silent prayers, which we offer for ourselves, for our strength and our sanity, and then also for those whom we love. And yes, Lord, we pray for peace. A peace that we cannot create. A 
a peace that lies within your hands in our response. Amen. Let's join together and sing, O little town of Bethlehem. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. place to lay your head on the night 
of your holy birth a crown or a robe of royal threat as your life begins on earth though some will not receive you or know just who you are I will prepare Thank you, Effie. Well, our Advent journey continues as we go through the Nativity story in the Gospel of Matthew, and our emphasis has been on the Nativity story as we find it in the Gospel of Matthew. As we know, there is no Nativity story in John or in Mark, and Luke takes a very different approach. Mary and Joseph are no longer in their hometown of Nazareth. The Magi from Persia within the Parthian Empire are no longer in Jerusalem. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us why Mary and Joseph needed to go to Bethlehem. It's only in the Gospel of Luke that we get the story of a census called by Caesar Augustus that required everyone from from the region controlled by Rome to go to their ancestral birthplaces or home places and register so they could be counted 
And you know why they wanted to be counted, right? To be counted so you could be taxed. That was the reason. Now, Joseph, being from Bethlehem, takes on this journey with Mary and Joseph, uh, Joseph and Mary, and Mary is pregnant, and they make their way to Bethlehem from Nazareth, about 125 kilometers. As I've been doing during this geography session, I try to give you something to compare it to. So 125 kilometers would be like going from Elmer to Chatham, on foot, Dale. Or if you can imagine uh, London being a little bit uh, less difficult to traverse through, it would be like going from here in Elmer to, to uh, Lake Huron to go to Grand Bend. And if you're a Hamilton fan, it's about the same distance from here to Hamilton. It's quite a walk. Five days' journey to doing about 20 kilometers a day. Now, around the same time that Mary and Joseph were arriving in Bethlehem, these Persian magi from the area of Iran that we know of today, we're, we're seeking to understand the significance of this star that they had seen in the heavens. And having determined that this star was pointing them to a place where the future king of the Jews was to be born, they naturally made their way to Jerusalem headquarters where they would find King Herod and most likely his successor there. Now, the journey would probably have been about a four-month journey, 1,600 kilometers to get from where they were in Persia to Jerusalem. That's Elmer to Atlanta or, or Moncton, New Brunswick, if you prefer. We could take the walk from here to Moncton, New Brunswick over four months, and we would have accomplished what the Persian Magi had accomplished. Now, by the time the Magi had interpreted the stars, gotten their financing, assembled their caravan, and completed their four-month trek to Jerusalem, probably a year or so would have gone by. More time passed as they met the king, and then the king called upon his scribes, and the scribes decided to analyze the text for themselves and very quickly came to the conclusion that the birth of the Messiah, the birth of the king of the Jews, was most likely Bethlehem. And so they redirected towards Bethlehem, and there they found a babe in a manger. No. What did they find? A toddler. R maybe running around if he was agile enough. He was lodging with his mom and his dad among relatives. You heard about the type of house they were in, right? Uh, you had uh, the rooftop where they slept because most days it wasn't raining. And they slept on a rooftop, and then below the rooftop is where they lived. It's where they had their living room and their eating area. And to protect their animals, their animals would be co-housed with them often. We, we don't do that here. No, we keep our dogs outside, and we keep our cats outside. But they, would, they, would have, they actually would house some of their precious animals with them. And they would have hay off to the side. It provided heat for the home body heat, and it was on the main floor and prote provided protection from the, the wild animals. And that's what they saw when they arrived. Now, Bethlehem was in a big town. Cindy West Falls already told us that, about the same size as Nazareth, maybe, maybe 50 homes. 
and probably spread around the area, not all localized on the corner. They would tend to build their homes adjacent to hillsides, and those hillsides provided limestone caverns and caves that they could use for storage and shelter and for housing and protecting their animals. The, the limestone that had broken off, they would use to make rock, rock um, dividers between uh, pastures. And so the, the, the sheep would be in the pastures. There, were far, there was farmland. One of the things Cindy didn't mention was the fact that only f- a five-kilometer jog away from Bethlehem, Herod had created a palace and a fortress for himself. A city, in fact. He called it Herodium. After who? After himself. And Herodium was like his, you know, his summer home in the Gatnos. It's where he would go to be outside of Jerusalem, fortified and strengthened, probably drawing on limestone that was in the area, That was just five kilometers away. That shows you how important Bethlehem was. Oh, look, there's Bethlehem. Let's build something five kilometers away. Nobody will notice. And now Bethlehem, under these rebuilding of the temple under Herod, had started to become more of a center for for the temple animals that would be required for sacrifices and some of the temple crops that would be used to feed the, the priests. Nowadays, it's, uh, it's got mining and the rest of the stuff around limestone, Jerusalem stone. But it was still a small village, 10 kilometers outside of the major center, Jerusalem. One of the things that struck me as I was looking at this passage, and as a pastor, I have to deal with this passage every year, and sometimes you wonder, can I find anything new? One of the things that struck me as I was reading this time is I asked myself, why Bethlehem? We don't know, based on the Gospel of Matthew, why Mary and Joseph ended up there. Luke tells us it was a Roman census. The shepherds were there in Bethlehem because they lived just on the outskirts and and an angel had miraculously appeared to them and told them something significant was happening in town and they should check it out. The magi who had initially intended to follow the star in the direction of Jerusalem They ended up in Bethlehem because of a prophecy, a prophecy that the Jewish people were aware of from the prophet Micah. You see, it was a prophecy that dated back some 800 years. Micah had prophesied during the time following the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, and now there may be a hundred years left in, in the existence of Judah as an independent nation. But Micah was preaching during the time of Hezekiah, who underwent a siege. After the fall of Israel, they tried to, the Assyrians tried to take over Judah and Jerusalem. And Micah was telling them that it wasn't going to be good. Within a hundred years, Jerusalem would be taken. Not this time, but soon. But there would be hope as well. In Micah chapter, ch- chapter 5, verse 2 to 4, we find these words, and these are the words that Matthew paraphrases for us in our story. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come to me, for me one who will be ruler over Israel, 
whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she is in labor, bears a son, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. This is the prophecy that the Herod scribes saw and passed on to the Magi. And so the Magi made their way to Bethlehem, and there they found a village hidden from among limestone rock faces and pastures alive with sheep, maybe 50 homes. And in one of those homes, Mary, Joseph, the toddler Jesus, lodging among relatives. No palace, no welcome committee, no feast to celebrate their arrival. And yet, as, Ma- as Matthew tells the story, and this is what intrigued me, these magi are not disappointed with what they find. They bring their gifts gold and frankincense and myrrh. They lay him before this ordinary child of an ordinary family in an ordinary house in an insignificant town. And they worship this child. Not because of some majestic show, Not because of some elaborate castle or a miraculous moment, but in the very absence of anything spectacular. The only spectacular thing that happens in Matthew's account of Jesus' birth is that there was a star in the sky. And it drew their attention. And it led them to a place where there was a prophecy which everybody knew and yet found fulfillment. A tiny, insignificant town transformed by a Galilean child I think all too often we have come to view our faith and our worship as something that demands a spectacle, a big church, a glitzy surrounding, an impressive music program, a celebrated preacher. a yoga class on Thursdays. We exhaust ourselves trying to be that which we think our faith demands, that we be always relevant and always productive. And in the midst of all of that, we forget that ordinary is good as well. When this story takes place, not when it's told, but when it takes place, Jesus is ordinary for those who gathered that day. The spectacular was in God's presence, God's voice. Why are we here today? Are we expecting 
a spectacle, a show, a good presentation. Or do we gather like the Magi who felt God speak to them? and decided they would not let the spectacle distract them from the real. Do we gather because the Christ revealed by God to us has changed our lives? Not this life alone, but the life to come. It's the faith that sustains us. It's the faith that makes tomorrow morning worth living. We gather because the faith that we live out every day in ordinary life is meaningful enough for us to take the journey. Take the time to say, Amen. Hallelujah. This is what God was talking about. The message of one who would come to shepherd his people. We gather with that message here, wanting each one of us to benefit from that and to share that and to be strengthened by that. Not in the spectacular. Hallelujah if you have a shepherd moment where an angel comes up to you. Hold on to that. Hold on to that till your dying day and beyond. But most of life is not in a shepherd's pasture with angels crying out. Most of life is a four-month journey on a camel to the wrong place then to the right place to find that the wrong place was a lot more spectacular looking than the wrong place, than the right place. And now that you're in the right place, you recognize it wasn't about the place at all. It was about the child revealed. If we can hold on to that during this Christmas season, maybe we won't be so exhausted that we won't enjoy it maybe we will remember that is the faith that leads us to celebrate, not the celebration that forces us to gather as a faith community. Have a Merry Christmas. I've got one more shot next week to wish you Merry Christmas again. (laughs) Let us pray. Oh, gracious God, we give you thanks that you reveal Jesus Christ to us. We thank you for moments of spectacle and celebration. We are filled with joy when we hear friends and family sing in our midst, when we get to sing with them, when we get to hear Scripture read from people we know, when we hear the Stories we have heard so many times before spoken again in community. When we hear your stories of Jesus' birth announced to us yet again. Reveal yourself to us in all of that. Draw us close to you, O God, that our faith may be lived out not only in moments of spectacle, but in the ordinariness of life. For that is where we meet you, O God, most often, day after day, after day into eternity. Amen. Let's join together for a closing hymn.
Know this, you are ordinary people. You are sheep. You are also God's chosen people. You are sheep of God's flock, which he leads through Jesus Christ our Lord. Rejoice in the knowledge that you are a chosen people, a chosen flock, and return into the world as a chosen people and share your joy.